and welcome to Cage Minds Uncensored. I'm Micah Frankel. Let's talk about some MMA. This past weekend, LFA, main card, as always, showing on Access TV. They were up in South Dakota, the Stanford Pentagon. That double flyweight title fight highlight outside of those two title fights would be the big knockout by Demarcus Jackson. I mean, a vicious combination. The right hand behind the ear starts it off. Left hooks, right uppercuts, just flattens Hamilton. Ash, under two minutes, a big knockout win, 8-2 and two for Jackson. That was a great victory. Big power, big power in those punches. Really explosive finish. You had a couple great wrestlers. You had Jordan Larson getting the arm triangle choke on Darius Flowers. You had Sabina Mazzo with a great display of distance control. Looked like she was in cruise control just on a Sunday drive Friday night. Just cruising. One, two, tearing up the front leg with the leg kicks. Mixing up, go high, go body. Nothing Shannon Sin could do to change the momentum. Mazo never looked threatened, couldn't find the finish. A great job by Sin of recognizing when the head kicks were coming where other opponents had not, but it was one-way traffic, a complete wash across the cards. The new LFA women's flyweight champion, that belt was vacant after Andrea Lee had vacated it. She's going to be making her debut in the UFC here next month. We're about... What, four weeks away from that one UFC fight night in Chile, which that card has been decimated by injuries, losing the main event because Santiago Ponzinibbio is injured, co-main event, something about the visa issues and the timing of the event due to also the timing of Vulcan Ozdemir's assault case in Florida, the bout with Vulcan Ozdemir versus Shogun Hua has been moved to UFC Fight Night in Hamburg, Germany. But back to LFA, because I got totally off base thinking about Mazo, thinking about the flyweight title, then going with Andrea Lee. But back to LFA 37. We also had the men's vacant flyweight title up for grabs, also vacated when... Roberto Sanchez got called up to the UFC Octagon. Sanchez, I believe, so far 1-1 one and one in the Octagon. But we'd have that title vacant no more. Sid Bryce came out looking very good early, pressing the pace. Perez, the Cuban Olympic wrestler, answering back with his wrestling. But a great job by South Dakota State Wrestling Champion Sid Bryce of Crete. Aiding scrambles, continuing to roll, and not succumbing to the position. At least in the first round. In the second round, it would be a different story as the gas tank would seem to be depleted from Bice after such a frantic first round. Eventually, it was Perez being able to slip around the back, push down Bice, trapping Bice. It looked like for a minute... That we were going to have just a complete devastation with one arm trap. With the left arm of Bices being trapped by the right hand wrist control of Michael Perez. He'd escape that position. But just getting stuck in that in-between mount, back mount kind of scenario. I believe 50 tapping punches in all. Because I don't want to say these were devastating shots. It wasn't a bloody throbbing mess that Sid Bias turned into, but he was being overwhelmed. He wasn't answering back, and eventually the ref jumps in. Michael Perez, the new LFA flyweight champion, with the necessity in the UFC for flyweights, you'd almost expect that Perez could be on that fast track, could be right on the way up that train to destination Big Show Octagon in the UFC. Then again, maybe Perez and Mazo, both Kings MMA products, so a big accomplishment for that gym. Two fight, title fight victories in one night. Maybe both have to defend their titles once. I think that's what we're going to see. That seems to be what's happening uh, as LFA's announcing LFA 40 in Dallas, Texas. You're going to have the current featherweight champion, Kevin Argular, making his first title defense, looking to unify the title with interim champion Thon Lee. Aguilar had been injured. So with that, 
So with that kind of scenario, I do believe Mazo Perez, we're looking at kind of a defend once, and then the UFC is kind of picking up from LFA right now. Just a little more testing. Also, because the UFC, it's hard to pick up every single LFA champion with the other competitors there are, not to mention Robert Watley now signing with the Pro Fighters League. We thought he'd stay in the LFA because he had read it for two more fights, but obviously that big golden nugget is very tempting. When you're talking about a million-dollar tournament, glad to see Robert Watley there, but he had to defend. So I think that's what we're seeing with the influx, with Dana White's Tuesday Night Contender Series, with the with this season of the Ultimate Fighter going on. The UFC is at a standstill right now for kind of bringing up talent. I think at this moment, if it's not injury-related, they're looking for some fighters to defend and really make a statement. Great first hands, though, in winning the titles again for Sabina Mazo and Michael Perez. That was on Friday night. Saturday, I jumped in the Crown Victoria, the 99 Crown Vic of Sal Gomez's great photographer, Gomez Photo Works, and we headed on down to Hobbs, New Mexico for Isidro Castillo's School of Hard Knocks Promotions. Havoc and Hobbs 7. You still want to watch the event? Go to the Cage Minds Combat Sports News Facebook page. Whole event there with commentary, yes, from yours truly. A six fight card. Card was decimated with injuries. We end up with six, with five amateur fights, one professional up at the top. So six fights in all. You get five finishes and three, four in the first round, sorry. Five finishes and four in the very first round. Daniel Martinez came out and landed some nasty leg kicks on Justin Strada and then swarmed in with the punches, knocked down Strada, finished it off with some ground and pound for a quick victory. Aaron Taylor clips Andre Mitchell across the chin with a big right hand. Taylor did not recognize how hurt he had Mitchell. Taylor, a former Valley wrestler, a second and fourth place runner-up in state tournament, went back to his wrestling days, shot in, put Mitchell on his back. Mitchell, though, able to clear the cobwebs, finds the triangle choke, several adjustments, a war of wills, but finally, finally, Taylor is forced to tap a big win for Andre Mitchell. Chase Eminer is able to do what he does, and that's turn his bout with Gabriel Casillas into a grappling match. In the second round, Casillas would try to get up in an inappropriate manner. Instead of cage walking, keeping that back flat against the cage, he would show some daylight, show Eminer some of that back. Eminer would jump right on the backpack position, pull all of his weight at the top shoulders, pulling Casillas back, they'd hit the ground, and quickly Eminer would find the rear naked choke. A big win streak looking very well lately. Chase Eminer coming on strong. Mateo Cordonero would survive being on his back for the first two rounds against Alex Galvan. Beating up Galvan from the bottom position though in the second round, which would prove big dividends. As the third round, Cordonero would get the sweep, get on top, and spend that round working his elbows and his knees to the body. A big decision win for the Perez Fighting System product, taking his zero away, as in he was 0-2, now 1-2, a big win for Mateo Cordonero. BJ Hurst talked to him backstage, a top caliber grappling prospect who's won state titles, national titles, international titles, threw one big heavy leg kick at Steve Navarro, switched up the game for the takedowns. We've talked about this before. Do not post when you're getting taken down. Putting your arm out can lead to nothing but bad things. I showed you Daniel Telemontes from Southwest Brawl 7. He dislocated his elbow. We showed you Brandon Gertz and talked about that from Bellator. 197 when he dislocated his shoulder. Steve Navarro dislocates his shoulder. And then some wicked ground and pound from BJ Hurst. Overwhelming to the ref. Jumps in. Actually a 25 second TKO in his amateur debut for BJ Hurst. And then in the main event, Derek Pettis, Victor Ward, Hernandez. They went to war. They came out swinging. They had a nice little back and forth of who was moving forward. Who would be moving backwards. Eventually it was Pettis. Clipping Hernandez with a right hand across the jaw. 
Pettis would get overextended, overextended, get in too close. The duck under to get to the back. Suplex position, belly to back, and a big throw from Hernandez. Pettis would roll with it, would get into the top position. Hernandez would recover into his guard. Pettis would stand up over the guard, having his full posture, throw the legs to the side, diving in right hand, not liking the way that punch felt. Hernandez gives his back. Pettis is able to jump on, take it, and force the rear naked choke victory for the tap at 59 seconds of the very first round. You want to go back and relive that event. Again, we have it at the Cage Minds Combat Sports News Facebook page. The full results, again, are at CageMinds.com. Like, you can find the results for LFA 37. And like right now, you can find the results for what we're going to talk about next. UFC Fight Night 128. The UFC was in Atlantic City in New Jersey. And Corey Anderson just put on a dominant performance, overwhelming with volume, and taking down Patrick Cummings nearly at will. A big win for Anderson. A 205-pound division that we just know is crazy upside down. Oh yeah, real quick, the Germany card, how I said that Vulcan Ozdemir is going to be taking on Mauricio Shogun Hua. You also have the addition of Glover Teixeira versus Alaire Latifi. So at somewhere, some point, somehow, hopefully, we will have a contender in the light heavyweight division, even though right now it's presumably Alexander Gustafson. I can't remember the last time he fought. Back to getting my mind back, though. Big win for Corey Anderson at home in New Jersey. A volume of punching. Patrick Cummings does not wear damage well. His face looked like a burger by the end of this one. Sierra Bahar de Zada lands one of the hardest teep kicks I've ever seen right to the liver. And as Luan Changas, the life is being sucked out of his body, losing air. A vicious left after cut right to the temple from Bahar de Zada. The Brazilian goes out. That's two in a row from Bahar de Zada. When he knocks you out, when he hits you clean, you will feel it. And it is a devastating, devastating kind of power. Chong has had his opportunity having Bahar de Zada's back in the first round. Unable to cash and having to stand with the heavy-handed striker was obviously detrimental. Controversy and the talk raining out across the world is about the next prelim I want to touch on. Ricky Simone, after being outworked, let's be honest, he was susceptible to the right hand, he was getting taken down, losing the scrambles, he was not having a good first and second round, looked like Murab Davishvili was on his way to a decision victory. That was before the last minute of the final round when Davishvili shoots in, gets caught up in a guillotine, Simone has a mounted guillotine at points. It's a one-arm guillotine. It looks like Davish Philly goes out, and the ref touches his arm, and Davish Philly pops back to life. He's kicking his legs. He's doing what he can with his lower body. For some reason, he's not really fighting with his arms or hands. It looked awkward to me. I'm not sure if that's the paralyzation from the choke. I've never been in that position myself. But Dagesh Philly is not pushing the hips. Simone is cranking, cranking, cranking. Davish Philly is not tapping. The bell sounds, and it appears that Devish Philly is out. He went to sleep. The fight, the commentator saying we'll be back with the decision. If we've made it to the final bell. The medical staff had ran in to check on Devish Philly, and the referee then acknowledges that the Team Saralongo fighter was out cold. Your winner. By technical submission, guillotine choke at five minutes of round number three is Ricky Simone. The LFA Bantamweight champion did not have a great debut. But I guess you can chalk up that one to a learning experience. The short nerders, the nerves, the step up to a big stage. But he finds a way to finish. People are losing their minds about, well, it made it to the final bell. How could you say he was out? The ref didn't know he was out before the final bell went off. Well, we do have a precedent for this because of what happened with Celine Haga and Amy Montenegro. That commission in Missouri messed up, and I actually got to applaud the New, Zer New Jersey commission for the right call. The fighter is out when that final bell rings, and you got to wake him up to get to the decision. If he needs that medical help to get off the canvas, obviously the victor, Ricky Simone, like he said, I looked, I stood over an unconscious foe. I was the victor. I got to agree with that. Not a good night for New Jersey's own Jim Miller. 
Daniel Hooker, jab, right knee, knockout, three minutes, three minutes in the first round. Hooker 3 and 0 up at 155. And I'd love to redo the rankings. Get guys, honestly, I'm gonna tell you this. Anthony Pettis is not deserve to be in the lightweight rankings. We should not have Nate Diaz in the lightweight rankings. And to be honest, of Conor McGregor, due to the lack of activity and obviously the current legal situation, he should be null and void from the rankings. Even though we know when he does come back, he'll be jumping into the mix. Just pull him for the rankings. There's God, guys like Mirab, Tyson, uh, Tyson uh, Mitterbeck, Tyson Mulov, and then we're also talking about a Gilbert Burns. We're talking about Daniel Hooker. These are guys that should be ranked, that are being uh, that are being active, that are putting in the work, and they should be in the top 15 lightweight rankings. Not these bigger names who are waiting for bigger paydays, hanging out on the sideline, and not actually being active. David Branch, he's known for throwing straight punches. Catches Tiago Santos off guard with a big right hook, big looping one, right to the jaw. Down goes Santos. It's a first-round knockout in two and a half minutes. Santos was looking to land a big left hook of his own. The one that landed first was the one that mattered. A huge win for David Branch, taking out Jocko. He lost to Rockhold. He takes out Santos. It maintains that top 10 ranking for David Branch, keeping him in contention for a big fight. Justin Wilness landed huge left hands. Beat Chase Sherman to the punch. Sherman had a very good, very aggressive third round, but was just not able to find his momentum to find his flow until the third round the first two rounds heavy hands big shots just thunderous left overhands landed by willness looked like the finish was on the horizon but it was not to be chase sherman came back big low elbows hard kicks stole that third round a good unanimous decision win for justin willness Frank Yeager, I gotta say I doubted him. I thought all the way Cub Sansa would win by knockout. I thought that Frank Yeager was a fool taking this fight, coming back so quickly. This was an emotional fight. Cub has recently lost a boxing trainer. Frankie has lost his father and his grandfather. It was a dream come true for Frankie to fight in New Jersey. It was a classic, bona fide, vintage Frankie Edgar performance, the feints and fakes, his footwork. Styles make fights. Some styles guys can't get around. Frankie Edgar is a bad matchup for Cub Swanson. He proved it once again. Too much volume. Not even getting any takedowns. I thought the wrestling, the first time that they fought, the big difference was the wrestling. Swanson stopped all the takedowns, but couldn't get his jab going till late. Never really challenged Edgar with a big shot to see how he'd react. A great performance from Frankie Edgar. He normally eats shots and gets damaged. This time he didn't. Wow. The Korean zombie, Chung Jung Sung, politely went on Twitter and asked for a, a next dance with Frankie Edgar. I'd love to see that fight made, especially knowing that the UFC is already trying to make Stevens versus Aldo, and that Ortega versus Holloway, hallelujah, has been added to that stat card. International Fight Week. It's almost too good to be true to think that we're going to get Miocic and Cormier, Holloway, Ortega on one card. Just hold my breath until that one happens. The main event, I thought this would go this way. Well, I didn't think it would be in such devastating fashion. But Kevin Lee is able, for the most part, to stick to the Khabib Nurmagomedov game plan of out-wrestling, ground and pounding, and just relentlessly ripping at the soul of Edson Barbosa. Kevin Lee did that, does it more emphatically than Khabib, does it with causing more damage. We also saw a great growth in the striking of Kevin Lee. Lee, with his grappling, or with his jab, with his crosses, was able to maintain some striking and put up a good battle on the feet against Edson Barbosa. Barbosa had his moment in the third round where he hit a spinning heel kick off the top of the head of Lee, but instead of landing with the heel, he landed with the side of the foot. I don't know how that makes the power difference, but Lee, after a chicken dance, was able to go back to that wrestling in his back pocket, get the takedown, and continue a beating that eventually would end in the fifth round as the referee would call for the doctors to come in and check Barbosa. Both eyes were swollen. There was a cut over and under the right eye. 
The referee calls the fight off. A big win for Kevin Lee. Kevin Lee, like the thing to do, call thing to do, calls out the champion, calls out Khabib. It's a ballsy call out. I like the call out, but I don't know if I like the fight. It's still my opinion that Eddie Alvarez lost a little something when he was not prepared to fight a couple weeks ago in Brooklyn. Well, why was Eddie Alvarez supposed to be ready? Eddie Alvarez had already publicly stated that he believed that Ferguson versus Nurmagomedov wasn't going to happen. Something would fall apart. That would be his fight. He called his shot. He said he'd be ready. And to lo and behold, to my disappointment, he was not. He was heavy, and Alvarez was not able to make the weight. I feel like that kind of knocks him down a peg because there had been the debate right now. Poirier... Alvarez both had stunning knockouts of Justin Gaethje. Not to mention, Poirier also got that signature win, beating former lightweight champion Eddie Alvarez. I think that catapults Poirier in that next level. You need that signature win. Kevin Lee went into the interim title fight with Tony Ferguson, and that was his opportunity for a signature win. He lost it. It's great to see him get another big win. He won in a main event against Michael Chiesa. He's won against Barbosa, but that's almost a prospect knocking off a prospect. Why does that Anthony Pettis win for Poirier hold so much weight? Because Pettis used to hold the title. That still means something. You think about Ferguson. When did Ferguson become a real bona fide contender? When he beat Rafael Dos Anjos. The only outlier in all this has been Khabib Nurmagomedov because he beat so many contenders in his way up. I feel like Kevin Lee needs that signature win against a bona fide champion. Allah, my thought would be let's make Khabib versus Poirier, Alvarez versus Lee. That's where I think the lightweight division should be going. But the lightweight division. You can't be sad about it. you got to be happy about it. you got to be excited about it because it's proving the depth. Just that stackness. And again, one more time, like I said, uh, Mirabak, Tysumov, Gilbert Burns, Daniel Hooker, these guys deserve to be ranked. These guys are excited. And we need to get guys like Diaz, doesn't want to fight, Connor, not fighting, not active, out of the rankings because as we saw with what happened with Paul Felder not being ranked or not being ranked high enough, the rankings matter in some people's eyes. We have to get this sorted out. And there is an obvious way to do it. That was a huge, devastating, emphatic performance from Kevin Lee, who looks to be an ultra-scary opponent. You talk about, if you want to throw Connor's name out there, Connor, Khabib, Kevin Lee, Tony Ferguson. The lightweight division is at a golden era almost. The only other thing worrisome about Kevin Lee is as he's calling out for a title fight, you miss weight for the interim fight. You miss weight for this fight. I feel like 165 pounds is very needed. Kevin Lee doesn't seem so enthusiastic. Then again, a lot of fighters aren't trying to show that chink in the armor if the weight is really that devastating, which apparently it seems to be. So again, another reason why I hope that we see Sooner than later, the 165-pound weight class become available. The UFC returned to New Jersey. It was a fun night of action. There was 11 fights in all. And I believe that I went 8-3 on the night with my predictions. Getting it wrong, honestly, I thought that Swanson would beat Edgar. I liked Santos to upset Branch. And I thought that John's might have had the kind of pressure-punching style that would have gained Sterling, Aljamain Sterling trouble, but the long-kicking game, the volume, Brett Johns just never got going. Those were the three fights I was wrong on. It was still another exciting week of UFC action. Do we have some news? Well, we have a ton of news breaking around. We have the Pro Fighters League, and if you're paying attention to CageMinds.com, PFL1 had already announced three lightweight fights, you have Andre Harrison, the former WSOF featherweight champion, taking on Turim Jumbeck. You have Lance Palmer versus Bukulat Magomedov and Timur Valia versus Max Cora. Well, now they've added a whole ton of more fights and guys, names that you'll recognize. Alexandre Almeida, Steven Seiler, Marcus Goval versus Nazareno Malagare, Ashan Jordan versus Mike Kyle matchup, Nick Rossbro, Jared Roshaw, Jake Hune, 
Josh Copeland versus Jack May. Francimar Barajosa, UFC vet, versus Victory FC heavyweight champion Daniel Galmore. Those are the names that the Professional Fighters League have put together on the first card for their first event. PFL won the Pro Fighters League. They kick off with their debut event. Not these little fight nights that they've had a couple, but their first event on June 7th from the Hulu Theater at Madison Square Garden. It used to just be the theater at Madison Square Garden. Very intrigued to see what the Professional Fighters League comes with. And it's intriguing to see how they also put this card together. Because if you didn't get it and you haven't looked up the article, it's a 12-fight card, 6 featherweight fights, 6 heavyweight fights. We're starting that kind of theme of the season, of the tournaments. So intriguing to me to see these weight classes being featured like this. Also intriguing to see the guys that are moving around. Uh, Marcus Goval, Timur Aliyev, they're moving up. They're both 35ers moving up to 45 for this tournament uh, scenario. Novo Inyao, UFC vet, Francimar Barjosa, we saw him every time they competed in the UFC at 205 pounds going up to heavyweight now. Jack May was coming off of a fight in Bellator. Interesting to see him now in the PFL. So very intriguing to see what the Pro Fighter League does. And I love the fact that we're going to see fighters, six fighters, these 12 fighter divisions, six of them, the tournaments by the end of the year, you get six guys winning a million dollars. Runner up is like 200,000. You make it to the quarterfinals, you're getting 100,000. Bonuses, money, these fighters need to be paid. And I am loving what the Professional Fighters League is doing. Not to be outdone. Bellator 200, which is going to take place this summer in London, England. They have announced a ton of prelims. Tough vet Sal Rogers, who had fibbed on his visa, I believe, and still not allowed back in the country, but Bellator is using him over there, will be the feature name on those prelims. Also in Bellator news, Bellator 202 has been set for July 13th. Julia Budd defending the women's featherweight title against finisher and Brazilian jiu-jitsu ace Talita Nogueira and you have former Bellator Bantamweight champion Eduardo Dantes in what I'm presuming is the number one contenders bout against Michael Mayday McDonald from my perspective kind of surprised to see that fight made surprised to not see that it's not Caldwell defending against McDonald you figure the that Bellator would have been all over making that one, especially with McDonald getting off the schneid with the win overseas. He got the victory. You figured the big-time free agent only needed one. Really getting ta- uh, challenged, though, there in Bellator is Michael McDonald. Is he ready to take on a wrestler the caliber of Caldwell? Or does Dantes once again get to stick his face back in that title picture, try to become the first ever, I believe, three-time Bellator champion? As far as this weekend goes, you have LFA 38 Friday night on Access TV. The main event, Jeff Hughes defending the LFA heavyweight title against Mean Marie Screen. Somebody's getting knocked out. Hughes trains with heavyweight champion Stipe Miocic there at Strong Style in Cleveland, Ohio. Green has looked really impressive his last couple. Green with a pair of Submissions in his last two fights. Four finishes, three of them by submission. No stranger to LFA, having fought at LFA 19 against James McDermott. We also saw him back in Legacy. He's a King of the Cage vet. Hughes, though, nickname Lights Out, put together a very impressive performance, bell to bell. Against Richard Odoms is very entertaining to see how he is able and impressive to maintain a consistent pace for being a larger heavyweight. That's Friday night on Access TV. Talking about heavyweights, Saturday night near Chicago in Illinois is the Allstate Arena. You have Bellator 198. The heavyweight tournament, heavyweight Grand Prix continues as Fedor Emelianenko meets Frank Mir. A dream fight that we've all looked forward to just happening possibly five, six years too late. Both chins are not what they used to be. The power is the last thing to go. 
They both land heavy. The first one that lands heavy probably wins this fight, hurting their opponent and either la ending it with ground and pound or getting the submission. I have a feeling, though, that it's Mir that takes down Emelianenko. I think that Fedor's time has slightly passed, but either way, it's going to be a quick night of work. UFC vet Sam Cecilia is in the co-main event against Illinois native Emmanuel Sanchez. I believe that Sanchez, the Rufus sport trained fighter, is going to put together a bell-to-bell -bell effort. Again, trying to push people to remember his name. Yes, that we know Daniel Weishel will be challenging Patricio Pitbull Freddy for the featherweight title. But not so quick, AJ McKee. Emmanuel Sanchez is battle-tested as taking down the toughest that Bellator has to offer. Sanchez needs a big performance again to get that attention. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu ace from the Gray from the Gracie Dynasty, Neiman Gracie takes on Mexican national Javier Torres. The most successful American Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu practitioner ever undefeated former legacy FC middleweight champion Rafael Lovato Jr. takes on John Salter. If it wasn't for Bellator signing Gegard Mousasi and giving him the fight with Rafael Corvalo. I truly believe John Salter, as far as the body of work that he's put in, in that circle, in the Bellator cage, is the rightful number one contender. This fight is for the number one contendership. The winner of Lovato Jr. Salter will fight the winner of Carvalho Musasi. Big stakes there in the middleweight division. Another renowned Brazilian, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu practitioner makes his first walk to the cage. Dylan Dennis, the Conor McGregor Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu trainer, will take on two and four. Yes, two and four. Two losses, two wins, four losses. Kyle Walker on the main card because you know Bellator is trying to make a star. The prelims, two guys that are recognizable to hardcore MMA fans, UFC vets, Dan Stitchin. And Eric Wisely are both scheduled to be in action on that Bellator 198 card. Told you guys that this past weekend I spent time in Hobbs for the Havoc and Hobbs 7 event. Also found out this weekend in some sad news that the Force of One Fighting Championships event scheduled for this Saturday was expected to be scheduled for April 28th. That event now, Warriors Path Fight to the End, has been canceled due to fights falling off the card, not enough replacements being found. So what do we look forward to next? We look forward to May 12th, an insanely busy day of combat sports throughout the state of New Mexico. School of Hard Knocks promotions will be in Clovis. So Clovis, don't worry, you're getting some combat sports soon. It's a night of boxing. Chaos in Clovis 2. Eligio Senna against Eduardo Silva, a heavyweight main event there in Clovis. The same night, Buffalo Thunder Resort and Casino. Holmes Boxing has got you covered as they present Night of Fury. The main event will feature Antonio Tom Martinez, Espanola's own, against El Paso's Gabriel Rodriguez, Maurice the Hulk Jackson, and Steve Me Machine Garcia, MMA fighters from the Jackson Wing Academy, both climb into the boxing ring for the first time. Also, Northern New Mexico female feature attraction, Leanne Martinez, will also be back in action. Edgewood, Edgewood, you guys are having an event too, May 12th. U.S. A.K.A. presenting amateur kickboxing and MMA. This week, CageMinds.com will have more up-to-date news on that event. But a trio of events throughout the state, May 12th. Gosh, it's going to be busy. Get out and watch some fights. The press conference is today as I'm recording. It's Tuesday. I'm going to be heading off here in a little bit. Not sure when the show will get uploaded, but the Jackson Wink Fight Night 3 event has officially been announced by Fresca's Promotions for June 2nd at his Letter Resort and Casino. The main event will see two guys that have been away from the game for about three years each, a little over. This is a rematch. Their first fight happened. It was a submission victory for Abel Cullum, who will rematch Josh Montoya, can't believe we're going to see this fight again. Can't believe both guys are coming back from retirement. Cage Minds Combat Sports News Facebook page will, will be streaming the press conference live. So even if 
you did not get to see it, you can go back, replay it. We'll have the video up. So that's June 2nd. June 16th, we'll be back at the Isleta Resort and Casino two weekends later as Wrecking Crew Promotions will have their first event. Fidel the, Fidel, the Atrisco Kid Maldonado Jr. will be defending his WBC Fee Car Super Lightweight title. Brian Labala Mendoza will be fighting for a WBC US NBC title as the same will be for Matthew Diamond Boy Griego. Obviously, different weight classes. Jordan Garcia and Lorenzo Benavides have also been announced for the card. That's the A side. Not sure about the B side. That's Wrecking Crew Promotions. The following weekend is June 23rd, where Legacy Boxing Promotions. We're once again with them at Route 66 Casino. Proview Networks will be streaming the event. It is Route to Glory 2, Bad Blood, two New Mexico State titles on the line, the main event, the fight that fans have been wanting to see since I started covering local boxing, Josh Pitbull, Torres, Christian El Puma Cabral, also the bad blood part of the car, a card, a third meeting between Mike Alderete and Mad Max Heyman. It's going to be an exciting night of action, not to mention undefeated prospects, Jason Sanchez, Ronnie Mongoose Baca, Angel Aaron Baby Perez, Augustine Jr. Perez, all of them to be on the card. So a huge night of action. That's June 23rd. The following weekend now we move to, and again, more combat sports than can be covered because there's two events. June 30th, Las Cruces, New Mexico, Southwest Brawl 8, presented by American Fight League. The very same night, Buffalo Thunder Resort and Casino will play host to Jackson's MMA Series 25. Breaking news just last week, the main event announced there, where Henry Barajona will take on undefeated Jess Martinez, coming off of the big win over Roy Cicito in the last Jackson's MMA Series event. That was number 24. So tons of local news, tons of events coming up. I even forgot and I blew over this and my apologies. Backtracking a bunch. LFA 39 is May 4th, Valley, Colorado, the Dobson Arena, Jerome Rivera, first time back to action since losing to Roberto Sanchez in that inaugural LFA flyweight title bout, not to mention Clovis's Harvey Park, the force of one championship fighter making his step up to the big show. So that is a huge one May 4th. The next night, May 5th, the Jackson's MMA Association in Colorado, in conjunction with Nemesis Promotions, will be throwing Renegade Fight Night, which will see Jordan Tatoni versus Flavian Pilgrim in the main event. The professional debut of Jalen Fuller, who's going to be taking on Juan Gonzalez. A huge night of action in Colorado. This weekend, the Force of One event again canceled. But don't worry, because on the 4th and the 5th there's events. On the 12th there's a ton of events. This summer, it is just crazy insane for the combat sports scene. Hope you enjoy some fights. This has been Cage Minds Uncensored.